Hi everybody, this is Brian in Tokyo wishing you a happy holiday. I'm here to read to you from one of my favorite books. I'm nestled up here on the rug. Uh, I just checked my bookshelf for this book, but I couldn't find it, so I, I found it on the computer and I'm gonna read it to you from my from the computer. Uh, this is the story, this is a story called Villa Incognito, uh, written by Tom Robbins, and um, this is the this is the first chapter. So it's a little, it's a little salacious. So uh, uh, maybe the kids need to, uh, mo mothers need to cover the kids' ears, but I, I think we'll make it through it. Okay, here we go. It has been reported that Tanuki fell from the sky using his scrotum as a parachute. That is not so ridiculous when we take into account the unusual size of Tanuki's scrotum. Well, okay, it's still pretty ridiculous, and no less so because in relation to his overall body mass, Tanuki's scrotum is proportionally larger than the scrotum of elephants, whales, and the Jolly Green Giant. In those days, his testicular balloon bag may have actually been even more voluminous than it is today, though that's difficult to imagine since his balls very nearly drag the ground as it is. And any increase in volume would surely have been an impediment to mobility if, indeed, not a source of some pain. There is also the possibility that Tanuki had, and perhaps still has, the power to increase or decrease uh, scrotum size at will. Yet having said all that, we must concede that the role of anatomical size, per se, in Tanuki's descent is not easy to determine, and a more pertinent question might be not how the badger managed to use his significant seed sack to parachute to Earth, but rather, where did he parachute from and why? Knock, knock. Who's there? Tanuki! Tanuki who? Don't be stupid, Tanuki himself! Oh, I see. And where did you come from, Tanuki himself? From the other world! What other world? The one before this one, moron! The world of animal ancestors! His voice could have been shoveled from a gravel pit. Ah, so. Excuse me, then, honorable ancestor. How did you get here? Parachute it in. It's, it's strictly forbidden, of course, against all the rules, but uh, what the hell. The farmer looked around for signs of equipment, for a silk canopy, uh, some kind of harness. Uh, never mind that, growled Tanuki. Well, what do you want here? To drink rice wine. Sake? Oh, understandable, but I don't think so. From the looks of your grin on your face, you've drunk too much sake already. Anything else? Yes, girls, pretty young girls. <laughs> the man snorted a laugh, snorted a laugh that something shot out of his nostril. Forget about it. No girl would have anything to do with a funny-looking creature like you. Ah, don't be so sure, old fool, snarled Tanuki. And with that, he butted the farmer in the midsection with such force that the man fell to the ground, speechless, gasping for air. Then, on his hind legs, round, be round belly jiggling like a Santa Claus, the badger waddled over to the well where the, ma where the man's daughter was filling water jars and fixed her with his toothy, high-voltage grin. A smile so overheated and manic and wild it could crack a funhouse mirror or peel the lacquer off of the chopsticks in the maiden's hair. What immediately follows is a brief and only partial clarification concerning Tanuki's nature. To wit, while virtually everyone refers to him as a badger, to the very point where badger is practically his second name. The scientific truth is, Tanuki is not a badger at all. Any zoologist will gladly point out that Tanukis are a species of East Asian dog, Nycteritis prosianodois, 
uh, possessing a long snout, coloration, and markings of a raccoon, although lacking the raccoon's famous ring tail. The fact that tanukis are nearly tailless, tailless, coupled with their penchant for standing upright on their hind legs, undoubtedly plays a role in tanukis being so generally regarded in an anthropomorphic light. At the edge of a dark forest, it would be fairly easy for the impressionable to mistake a tanuki for a little man. But thanks to his otherworldly powers, there happens to be an even more legitimate reason for Tanuki's anthrop anthropomorphic reputation, and we shall soon find out. Before moving on, however, we must address the probability that the perceptive reader will have noticed in our narration an apparent and perhaps troubling inconsistency. Unless the author is simply too careless and sloppy to be trusted, why does he sometimes write tanuki, singular, individual, a capitalized proper noun, and at other times, even in the same paragraph, write tanukis, plural, generic, an unco uncapitalized common noun? The explanation is simple. The badger creature uh, li is like a god, both one and many, both in the same instant, like God. As anyone who knows anything about the unknowables wells know, well knows, God and gods are interchangeable. The exclusivistic patriar patriarchal Jehovah Allah freaks are not incorrect when they insist there is but one supreme being and that he is immutable and absolute. However, neither are the wide-eyed inclusive pagans and primitives wrong when they recognize gods of fire alongside gods of rivers, honor the moon, the moon goddess, a crocodile spirit, and deities who, ride, who reside in, among countless other places, tree trunks, rain clouds, peyote buttons, and neon lighting, especially the flashing whites and the greens. Thus, if the reader is wise enough not to impose human limitations on narrow notions of un uniformity on the divine principle, and is nimble-minded enough to realize that he or she can be, and perhaps should be, simultaneously monotheistic and pantheistic, then he or she will have scant problem in accepting the paradoxical essence of our small friend Tanuki of the Tanukis. At first, the daughter at the well seemed prepared to accept Tanuki's invitation to lie down with him. She was a farm girl, after all, and the mating activities of animals were as familiar to her as the sprouting of rice or the ripening of plums. Likewise, bestiality was not uncommon to her, for she had brothers, cousins, and young male neighbors who, from time to time, were prone, were prone to so indulge. If we seldom ever, if ever, hear of girls participating in such sword practices, it's certainly not because rural girls are any less lustful than their masculine counterparts. Perhaps it's due rather to the universal girlish character, which is cleaner, more restrained, sensitive, and finer grained than any of the hopeless coarse adolescent male. Or it may be only a matter of logistics. It's one thing for a hormone-racked boy to mount a ewe, but a maid, a maid presenting herself to a ram is so awkward an enterprise as to be nearly unthinkable. It would test the girl's ingenuity and probably confuse the ram. Still, Tanuki was no ordinary beast. He walked upright, had a charming accent, uh, a confident and exotic matter, and a riveting, if somewhat unnerving, grin. So cute was he, so persuasive, that she, that she soon found herself loosening her kimono. At last, when he commenced to boast about how he had recently parachuted to earth from the other world, she grew frightened and ran away and bolted to the farmhouse door and bolted the farmhouse door behind her. I thought I saw a demon, she told her mother to explain the blush and why she'd, turned, she'd returned home without water. <sighs> Dejected. Tanuki stole a small jar of sake from its cooling place in the well and lumbered off into the forest brood to brood. 
At some point during the night, when he was quite tipsy, he began to drum on his protruding belly, as tanukis are wont to do. Blabonga, blabonga. The sound of his drumming eventually attracted a kitsune, a fox. You idiot, Kitsune scolded him after Tanaki had bemoaned his woeful failure. How could you be so naive as to tell a human the truth? Men live embedded themselves in ongoing systems of illusion, religion, patriotism, economics, fashion, that sort of thing. If you wish to gain the favor of the two-legged ilk, you must learn to fabricate as wholeheartedly as they do. Actually, by sabotaging their, st their static illusions, we can sometimes help turn their stale deceptions into fresh possibilities. But that's probably a mission you're neither interested nor suited for. So just lie to people any way you see fit and reap what benefits you can. But do bear in mind that you should never lie to yourself. Much of the fox's wisdom was lost on the drunken badger, but he grasped one important fact, and the following dusk, when he approached the farmer's daughter at, at the well, he took a different tact. Oh, my pretty cherry flower, he rasped. I am, in fact, merely a simple beast of the woods, who has become enchanted by your beauty, and yesterday was driven to misspeak due to the intensity of my desire to hold your sweet hand and nuzzle your exquisite neck. Oh my, gasped the girl. And she watched him with a mixture of pity, vanity, and awe as his tiny fingers undid her sash. Afterward, leaving the girl exhausted on the moss, Tanuki rapped at the farmer's door. Kong, kong, kong. Ten thousand pardons, honorable sir, he said, bowing deeply. In addition to the impolite interjection of my head bone into yesterday's conversation, uh, I'm afraid I also told you a little fib. Uh, look at me, sir. Uh, look me over. Obviously, I'm no animal ancestor. It's damned ridiculous. No, 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 no. I'm merely in a poor orphan of the woodlands, temporarily down on his luck and maddeningly, maddeningly hungry. Both frogs and wild onions are scarce in this season, and my ravenous self would be forever in your debt if you might spare a... Somewhat apprehensively, the farmer set a bowl of boiled rice by the kitchen door. Tanuki proceeded to eat, taking deliberate dainty bites, chewing very, very slowly. And when his host grew bored and turned his attention to some household chore, the badger suddenly seized a cast of sake quite as large as, as himself, and short legs pumping, heavy scrotum swinging, escaped into the bush one step ahead of the farmer's axe. That night, Tanuki got snockered so enthusiastically that the sake got snockered with him. He thumped his belly, plabonga, 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 and his grin fought a duel with the moon. Tanuki relished homemade sake. He liked dancing his drum belly dance in the moonlight. He liked gorging himself on fat frogs and yams. And as much or more than anything else, he liked seducing young women. After his initial success with the farmer's daughter, he embarked on a long spree of seduction. Over the years, he enjoyed a great many such successes. And the encounters brought him immense delight. Despite the fact that some of the girls would later give birth to strange-looking babies, which, believing them to be demon children, the girls' families would drop over a cliff or drown in the nearest creek. Eventually, however, Tanuki grew weary of country girls and their frank and easy ways, and he commenced to wander into cities where the women were glamorous and sophisticated, were wrapped in rich silks, recited poetry, served sake of a noticeably finer quality, and smelled of powders and perfumes instead of farm sweat. After stealing into a garden or a courtyard or a courtyard garden, he would saunter up to a woman there, his scrotum swaying, his smile on fire. Pardon me, he'd say. I'm a lonely denizen of the Purple Hills who has been pulled into town by nothing but the beacon of your own beauty, which in my innocent way I long to 
Reaction depended upon the female's age. A really young girl, 15, 16, 17, would scream as if a Godzilla egg had been hatched in her bathwater and run right out of her gaiters in haste to reach the safety of the house. Girls in their 20s, on the other hand, would hurl their gaitas at him or would hurl books and flutes and teapots and iron lanterns and inkwells and stones, hurl them with such bone-bruising force that it became his turn to scramble to safety. If the object of his intentions was 30 years old or older, she'd usually regard him with calm contempt, wag a sharp painted nail at him and admonish him coldly, You're stinking up my chrysanthemum beds, you obscene monkey. Crawl back to your filthy lair before my retainer treats you to a taste of his blade. Each successive rejection took a larger bite out of Tanuki's confidence, until finally it was gnawed down to the core. With what passed for a tail between his legs, he did, indeed, slink back into the hills, so far back that the lights of no city, town, or village could muffle the silent beeping of the stars. After a half-hearted meal of shelf fungus, he slurped down a purloined sake, the down-home variety, and began a half-hearted shuffle upon fallen leaves, and around midnight, a fox appeared. (laughs) What a pathetic! Pathetic excuse for tummy thumping, Kitsune chided him. I could produce better plabungas by beating a steamed dumpling with a toothpick. Have you completely dissipated your sense of rhythm? Resisting an impulse to bludgeon the Kitsune with his empty sake jar, Tanuki instead embarked on a mournful litany of urban failures, not caring that he was losing face by the bucketful. Kitsune shook his orangish head. Oh, it's beyond me, he said. How you ever acquired a reputation for cunning? (laughs) Listen, lover boy. All human beings can be deceived, but they can't be deceived in the same way. The very hook that will snag a bumpkin, an educated cosmopolitan will spit out or brush aside. Unless, of course, it's baited with money. That fatal lure that regular makes that, that regularly makes fish out of men of every station. Uh, yeah, I hear you can exchange it for money. To, I hear you can exchange it for sake. Tanuki objected. The good stuff. Uh, that's true, but you'd have to steal the money in order to purchase the sake. So why not just steal the sake and cut out the middleman money? Before it was invented, men were nearly as savvy as us. Not that you're overwhelmingly savvy. All that, hug me, I'm a furry little lost animal crap, that's for amateurs. That's for house pets and teddy bears. You haven't sorted out the knots and tangles of the human mind. Well, I'll tell you this much. If you're going to recline on a lady's futon, you're going to have to recline there in a gentleman's body. But how? 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 Are you an animal ancestor, or aren't you? (sighs) Properly exasperated and convinced that food, beverage, and worthy entertainment were irreversibly absent from the badger's clearing, that evening Kitsune lopped off into the shadows. Tanuki lay down in the dead leaves and tried to attain a degree of sobriety necessary for a full grasping of the fox's meeting. A few snowflakes began to fall, falling slowly, very slowly, taking their time, as if waiting for Tanuki or anybody to notice them, as if stalling until someone wonderstruck bystander might remark on their beauty and how no two snowflakes are ever exactly alike. At what point, it's fair to ask, did snowflakes start believing their own publicity? That had been the first snowfall of the season, when the last snow fell at winter's end, toward the middle of March, the figure that stood in the badger's clearing was casting a human-like shadow. Falling only marginally faster than November's intrepid trailblazer, preening on the breeze, boasting in a fluttery stage whisper, 
Regardez-moi, the likes of me has never been seen before and will never be seen again. The very last flake in line, self-delusional to the finish, landed on the eyelid that could have belonged to Toshiro Mifune, complete with epicanthic fold. There, it was summarily flicked off by a thumb. Not a claw, but a thumb. Thanks so much, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. Villa Incognito by Tom Robbins. Happy holidays. Happy Advent. Hello to Thomas and Gerberg and all the good people of Alan and, and all around the world. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.